this is Esther with Discover Your Origins. In this video, I'm going to take a good look at the 1800 U.S. Census. Everything that I'm going to talk about in this video and the resources and links can be found at my blog um, at discoveryourorigins.com. So I encourage you to go there to get the resources. The first place I go to look for information about a U.S. Census is the National Archives. The National Archives has created a frequently asked questions page about each of the U.S. Censuses, and this is the one for the 1800 Census. This is the second census that was taken after the ratification of the Constitution, and it has a lot of similarities to the 1790 Census. Um, the Census Day was August 4th, 1800, and supposedly it took about nine months to complete the, the census count. And the rules were very similar to the 1790 census in that they named the head of household and then included a count of the household members. Um, it was performed by the U.S. Marshals in each federal district, and they had some um, appointed assistant marshals. And the U.S. citizens were legally required to participate. Um, any person over the age of 16 years old was required to participate. The questions that were asked were very similar. You know, they wanted the name of the head of the family, and then the counts that were included were more specific than the 1790 census. So, for example, there would be a number of free white males under 10 years of age, and then the number of free white males of 10 and under 16 years of age. And it goes on through, and the females were also broken down, you know, the number of uh, free white females under 10 years of age, number of free white females age 10 and under 16 years of age, so on. It did include a count of the number of all other free persons, including Africans. This was not, um, did not include a count of Indians, as it says here on the page, and it did count the number of slaves. So the form generally looked like this picture here on the uh, web page, although the U.S. Marshals had to supply their own paper um, because they did not provide uniform printed forms unless the Marshals paid for them out of their own pocket. So they used whatever paper they could find um, in most cases. So once the census was completed, the counts were made and forwarded to Washington and then the census forms were stored at the federal district courts in each location. Um, all of the states were counted, including some outlying territories, but not all of the census forms survived. So um, there are some missing records, uh, particularly for Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, the territory of Mississippi, and a large part of Ohio. And again, there were some places or areas that were included with other states. So for example, Maine was included with Massachusetts in the 1800 census. And then there's some um, breakdown in what was included in Ohio on this page. So some of these forms, they were lost. And eventually the surviving forms were forwarded to uh, Washington DC for preservation but it is possible that individual sheets were lost just in the process of storage and transportation and handling, and so it is possible that there are individual pages missing from other locations. Um, and eventually they were bound into books and, and then eventually digitized. So like the other census, this census is available for viewing at Ancestry.com, Family Search, and other places. The Wikipedia article for the 1800 U.S. Census includes um, statistical information if you're interested in that. I find it easier to look at the Wikipedia page than dig around on the National Archives or U.S. Census Bureau pages. And the total population that was reported is 5,308,483 people. And again, the most populous state was Virginia and the least populous state was Delaware. And then there is a more statistical breakdown um, for the individual states. 
it's possible that again the count was not completely accurate and you know we're still dealing with a growing country with a lot of people living in rural areas who were not easily accessible and also again because the possibility of lost data and whatnot it is possible this count isn't completely accurate and the, the likelihood that there are people missing in the census that should have been there is also high but it's still worth a look um, so you may be wondering how the 1800 US Census can be helpful in your family history research again the information that is collected is pretty minimal you have the name of the head of household and the counts of the various people in the household but it can help confirm location again and looking at the neighbors that are next to your ancestor can help confirm your ancestor if you can also trace the neighbors and through inference you can identify various members of the household who were also present it's not perfect i mean it's hard you can't know 100 percent for sure but you can make a pretty reasonable guess um, when you look at the family and then compare that with the counts on the census. So I have a case study here, an example of um, how you can do this. And we're going to look at the Brockway family again. I looked at them in my previous video. And this is Justice Brockway. He is the son of Samuel Brockway and Margaret Smith, who I talked about in my previous video. Um, Justice was born in Connecticut. I think it's reasonable to assume that's probably where he was born. And his christening is also in Connecticut. And then he, Justice migrates to New York, to Steventown, New York. And that's where he dies. Uh, Justice marries Alice Gardner in New York. And he has eight girls and six boys. So he has a large family. And... So we're going to look at these children a little bit closer as we evaluate the census. So let me show you what the 1800 U.S. Census looks like. Again, it's very similar to the 1790 census. Um, this particular um, area does not have page numbers. And you can also see that there was some damage to the top of the paper here. And so we're pretty fortunate that we probably didn't lose any data on this particular sheet. Um, and then the column headers don't have the titles of the columns. So you'll probably need to have the list of those, um, you know, in a form somewhere else so you can kind of transcribe it. So let's look for Justice Brockway. So here he is. He's one, two, three, fourth person down. And then we have Justice Brockway Jr. And then you can see the counts that go across and then the same for Justice Brockway. So I already um, have transcribed these numbers. I'm going to go back to my blog page where I, I break down these numbers. So you can see here that I wrote down um, the category and the numbers that went with it for each of the columns. And we're going to look at the children a little bit closer to see because there's not 14 children here. So let's look at the family a little bit closer. So one, we know that Justice is in his own household, so he's not going to be there. Elsa and Elizabeth and Lucy, they're married and in their own household. And then if you look a little bit closer, this girl named Rowana supposedly died in 1792. So she's probably not there either. And then if you look at the two youngest children, one is born in 1805 and one in 1811. So they're not there in the 1800 census. So that leaves one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children that should be in the count of the 1800 census. Now, Rowana is interesting because there is a death date here for her. Um, it's a rather specific date, but the sources are, don't have any support for that date. So I'm not saying that that date is wrong, but um, it's questionable because it needs a source. So, um, so that kind of breaks down the family a little bit better to see who all was in the household. 
So let's go back. So we have three males, 10 to 16 years old. We have two males, 16 to 26. One male that's 45. Two females under 10 years old. And one female that's 45. So right off the bat, you can probably assume that the male over 45 and the female over 45 years old are probably Justice and Alice. So I went through here and I took the children's birth dates and the who was living and assigned them to each of these categories to see if I could identify everybody who was there. So the three males that were 10 to 16 years old I'm guessing are probably Samuel, George Washington, and Simeon Brockway. Now Simeon, he's only three years old. And so it's possible that this count of three males, 10 to 16 years old, um, does not actually include Simeon. Um, he should be there under the um, category of males under 10 years old, but he's not. So. It's curious if maybe that birth date is wrong or um, maybe something happened to Simeon and there's another child. That it needs a little bit more research. If we look at the family grouping again um, for Simeon, he supposedly died in 1872. Um, and he does have some sources for his birth date um, that need to be evaluated to see if they support these birth dates and death dates. So, um, so there's a possible research question right there. And then the two males that are 16 to 26 years old are uh, Benjamin Gardner and Jesse Brockway. And then, of course, we have the father, Justice. And then the two females are the two youngest girls, Claremont and Az Azuba. And then the mother, who's Alice Gardner, is the female over 45 years old. So I kind of talked about, you know, how you can attribute each of the children and people in the household to the categories. I mean, this is not a for sure a thing. You can basically, we're assigning this through inference, but it has identified a couple of places with this family that needs some additional research. Um, so let's look at Justice Brockway again here really quickly. And I had always assumed before I started looking at the Brockways that a fair amount of research had been done on the families in family search, and so I've not really spent much time with them. But as I've kind of been going through the census with them again, I am finding places where research can still happen and clarify the family and the information that we have on them. So for example, as I'm looking through some of these children, there's not very many sources and um, you know, some of them are missing information, like Benjamin Gardner, we don't have a death date. Um, others, we have more information. But they need a little bit more research, especially like this person, Rowana. Uh, you know, I'd like to know where this birth and death information came from. Um, and then, you know, as you're going through more of these families, you're seeing, okay, there's there's definitely some things here that could be cleaned up um, to know for sure. Like, you know, Simeon Brockway, we have a death year. Where did that come from? And we'd need to evaluate the sources a little bit better and, and so on. So, um, so let's look at the 1800 census uh, page again to see if there's anything more we can learn uh, for more research uh, opportunities as well. And Justice Brockway's wife was Alice Gardner. So if you look at this page, there are several gardeners on here. There's a Benjamin Gardner, um, this other person that this name is obscured, a Simeon and a Caleb. And so you have to wonder if they are extended family members of Alice or not. And so that would be a really good place to do some more research. Anyway, I hope this was helpful in how you can evaluate a census like this and see how you can um, use it to analyze the family and learn more about um, the household and everything for your family history research. Um, thanks for watching.